Greetings all. Yes, I know I'll get this off the bat right away. I know military civics is something of a contradiction in terms as military is defined as not civilian. But I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and move a little bit away from armor and into a civics lesson. As most of you know, I am a reservist in the US Army, more specifically a guardsman. However, the exact nature of the structure of the US military and all the different types of army which are in the US is a matter of some confusion amongst a number of US personnel, let alone foreigners on the outside looking in, who are trying to figure out how the US can have multiple armies. For example, it may come as a surprise to some that though my uniform says US Army on it, my commander in chief at this time of recording is not the president of the United States, it's a bloke named Greg. This is somewhat related to the structure of the United States and would explain, for example, why the unit central to holding Little Round Top for the Union Army at Gettysburg was the 20th Maine and not the 20th US Infantry, whilst 11 actual US Infantry regiments also fought at Gettysburg not associated with any state at all. So I'm going to help you figure this out. And starting at the top, there are eight uniformed services, of which six are the armed forces. These are, in order of precedence, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Space Force, and Coast Guard. The Coasties are last because they are currently under the Department of Homeland Security, not the Department of Defense. When placed under the control of the Navy for wartime, they would move their flag to being in front of that of the Air Force. The other two uniformed services, and here's your trivia question, are the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Commissioned Officer Corps and the U.S. Public Health Service Commissioned Corps, which is why you'll see the Surgeon General wearing a uniform derived from the Navy's. However, that's all high-level stuff. We're going to ignore the other seven and focus on the U.S. Army, which is split up into four major subcomponents. Regular Army, the Army of the United States, the Army Reserve, and the Army National Guard. Yes, the Army of the United States and U.S. Army are not the same thing. Indeed, it is possible to be in both the regular Army and the Army of the United States at the same time at different ranks. For example, March 1943, when he was in North Africa, Patton had the rank of Lieutenant General in the Army of the United States and Colonel in the regular Army. At the same time, his boss, Eisenhower, was wearing the four stars of full general while still holding the rank of lieutenant colonel in the regular army. If you were enlisted, you were in the one or the other, not both. Your service number would begin with RA or AUS accordingly. The difference is you know, basically between the peacetime army and the expanded wartime army. With the basic structure of the army being the division, it was decided that divisions 1 to 25 would belong to the regular army. These were the full-time professionals who volunteered in time of peace. Numbers 26 through 76 belonged to the National Guard, and 77 upwards were National Army, also known as Army of the United States. Actually, they were previously known also as U.S. Volunteers, but eventually folks became voluntold during drafts. Yes, I know 82nd and 101st are regular Army. That happened later. If you did have multiple ranks, generally speaking, in time of war, the higher one ruled. So Eisenhower could legitimately order around the 1st Infantry Division's commander in North Africa. But in peacetime, in the deactivation of the Army of the United States, the lower rank was what counted. And this is what led to all those folks getting demoted after World War I, such as Patton going down from Lieutenant Colonel back to Captain. Now, as a general rule, if you were drafted, you became part of the Army of the United States. The AUS permitted the expansion of the US Army beyond what Congress authorized for the manning of regular or permanent, if you wish, army. Now, the Army of the United States does remain a thing in theory, but in practice has not existed since the end of the draft in the 1970s. So barring national emergency, we will not see it again anytime soon. That's two of the four. The next one to talk about is the US Army Reserve. These are, as the name implies, reservists. The archetypal two weeks a year, one weekend a month sort of thing. Or just folks who are on call if they're in the individual ready reserve. Hi James, as folks who were recently discharged. 
The Army Reserve, as a general rule, does not have any combat arms units. The last combat divisions were deactivated in the 1970s, and only the 100th Infantry Battalion remains as a combat arms unit in the Army Reserve. It's a matter of heritage. This is a result of some policy decisions involving the Army National Guard, not any particular law. They also have all of the US Army's civil affairs units. The Army Reserve is a federal organization with the President of the US at the top of the chain. Which now brings us to my mob, the Army National Guard. Remember foreigners, the United States is a plural, indivisible, but a plural, and indeed in order to avoid confusion as to loyalties, the oath of commission was changed in the middle of the Civil War to change from bearing, quote, true allegiance to the United States of America and to serve them honestly and faithfully, unquote, to simply supporting and defending the Constitution of the United States. It's why each state votes separately for president, why they each have two senators regardless of population, and so on. In many respects, it's actually closer to the EU than a single nation. Each state is its own little country. It has a defined jurisdiction, a constitution, legislature, laws, court system, police force, government departments like health, justice, transportation, treasury, education, and so on and so forth, and defense. Any self-respecting Department of Defense controls armed forces, and the head of the armed forces in question is the governor of the state or territory. DC is an exception because it's DC and it's quirky. A state military department, like the federal military, will normally consist of multiple subcomponents, and these are normally the Army National Guard, the Air National Guard, and the state militia. This last can then include both soldiers and also a naval militia. I don't think any state has an air militia. Again though, we're going to ignore the zoomies and stick with the army. The National Guard is basically funded by the federal government, trained to federal standards as part of the total army system. So when I went to basic in Fort Knox, my class was split about 40-40-20 regular army, National Guard, army reserve. You can't tell by the uniform unless you can identify the unit patch. However, we belong to the governor. That means, for example, that I am not currently subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I am subject to the Texas Code of Military Justice. Though in reality, most states just tend to mirror the federal code for simplicity. Federal regulation can also control membership because they're controlling the pay. Marijuana may be legal in California, but if a California guardsman tests hot for it in a drug test, the federal governing body, the National Guard Bureau near DC, has regulations to have him discharged. Also, as an officer of the state, one can have some interesting authority. So, for example, when I was a commander in Nevada, I had the authority to write arrest warrants for AWOL soldiers for civilian police to execute. The template for the words to be used in this warrant is even provided in Nevada legislation. See Nevada Revised Statute 412.2675 if you're curious, as I had to inform the dispatcher who was insistent upon knowing which judge signed the warrant. Now granted, I did get a slap on the wrist for incurring an expense to the state without asking first, but it did stop AWOLs in my unit. Some states, when ordering the state service, guardsmen are categorized as peace officers, with all the accompanying powers and privileges. Which brings us to one of the big differences between the Guard and the purely federal US military, domestic duties and powers. The terms you will often hear referred to are Title 10 and Title 32. These are parts of the US Code, the body of laws which govern the US. As a matter of practice, Title 10 is the federal military and Title 32 are guardsmen, recognized by the federal military, paid by the federal military, but not under federal military control. There is a third condition, state active duty. This means that the governor has called out the guard, but the pay is coming out of the state's treasury and not diverted out of the federal budget through the National Guard Bureau. If the disaster is bad enough, the federal government may assist the state by paying for the manpower, which then converts them from state active duty to Title 32 duty, but the practical reality is that there is no difference on the ground except that the pay might be better. Troops will still get their orders from the state governor. Which brings us to that famous law, the Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the use of federal troops for law enforcement duties within the US. Technically, it only applies to the Army and the Air Force. The law is silent on the matter of the Navy and Marines. 
uh, but current written policy instructs Navy and Marines to consider themselves to be bound by it. I've actually not looked into Space Force yet, and I presume they're also not technically covered. It also has a number of exceptions, such as protection of federal property and, of course, the Insurrection Act, which has been popular recently, and uh, these exceptions I'll get back to in a moment. The country takes this sort of thing seriously. Even when a local overworked police force asks for assistance from a nearby base just for directing traffic around an accident scene, court cases have been successfully prosecuted. The Army Reserve is also subject to this limitation, as it is a federal force. Guardsmen, however, are not. Either on state active duty or Title 32, they can do any lawful tasks directed by the governor to include law enforcement. Thus, the most flexible option for a governor is to have the feds pay for his troops, but keep them under his control and not federalize them. Now, remember also the possibility of having two ranks in the regular army in the Army of the United States? The same can happen with the Guard, as they are two different organizations. When I commissioned, I received two certificates of commissioning. One was signed by Secretary of the Army Thomas E. White on behalf of the President of the United States, and the other was signed by Gray Davis. Had I been a year later, my commission would have been signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, which would have been actually pretty cool. No, I wonder if Chuck Norris would run for governor. I mean, that would be an awesome signature to have on your commission. I certify, you know, I hereby commission you as the second lieutenant of infantry, Chuck Norris. No. Oh, well. As a matter of practicality and policy, though, almost no promotions happen in the Guard unless they are confirmed by the federal structure. It's called FedRec or Federal Recognition. However, it has happened on rare occasions that, for whatever reason, a promotion will happen in the Guard despite the lack of federal recognition, particularly with regards to general officers, which often require congressional involvement. Thus, I have seen a case where a general could wear two stars within the state, but if he ever left the state or hopped onto a federal base, he'd have to take a star off. And I do seem to recall some state about 10 years ago did a little bit of nepotism and randomly appointed a former enlisted soldier to act as the adjutant general, the state's senior military officer. Okay, hopefully you are with me so far. Now it gets complicated. Now imagine the condition that this is a serious national disaster and the state's National Guard is no longer capable of handling things without assistance. Other states may help out, or federal troops may get involved. But now we have a problem of command. The National Guard's command goes to the governor, and the governor is not in the chain of command of active duty troops. A Title 32 general basically cannot order around a Title 10 private, even though they're in the same uniform, and the private would be very well advised to follow the instruction. Much like a second lieutenant trying to ignore an instruction from a command sergeant major, it will not end well in the long run regardless of legality. But given this, how does one efficiently coordinate a response between two different army organizations, the Title X Federal Military and the Title 32 Guard? The solution to this is called a dual status commander. This is normally a National Guard general who is approved to wear both a Title X and Title 32 hat at the same time. So when he's speaking to a guardsman, he's wearing his Title 32 hat. When he's speaking to a regular army soldier, he's wearing a Title X hat. So remember what I said about each state being its own little country? The state is in charge, not the federal government. Defense support for civil authorities, or what is known in some countries as aid to the civil power, is another long topic. But the bottom line is that the federal organizations, such as the Army, FEMA, and so on, respond to the needs and requests of the state governor and his delegates. And this applies to any situation from wildfires to coronavirus. Now, in the event that the federal military needs to draw upon its reserve components, the president can order the National Guard into federal service. It is, in U.S. code, part of the organized militia of the U.S. The other part is the naval militias, which I'll come back to again. If you're curious, the unorganized militia is all able-bodied males aged 17 to 45 who are or intend to become citizens of the U.S. And this is basically the source of the draft, or the selective service you may have registered for. If you are female and not in that age 17 to 45 band, don't think that you're safe. I'll come back to that too. After Vietnam, there was a deliberate decision to place most of the U.S. Army's combat power into the National Guard, 
the thinking being that there would be less chance of any military expeditions without having to draw upon the reserves with all of the political liabilities that that would entail. There are some quirks to Vietnam as well. Yes, the Guard was briefly in Vietnam, and no, most draftees did not go to Vietnam, but that is another topic again. Anyway, the federal government decides it needs a National Guard. It calls the Guard unit into federal service, changing it from Title 32 to Title 10, and suddenly everything changes. The unit is plucked from the state's chain of command and goes through the federal combatant commanders to the President of the United States. It is now subject to the UCMJ. It is subject to Posse Comitatus. It is, to all intents and purposes, now part of the federal U.S. military. This rapid and dramatic change in condition is probably best demonstrated by what happened to the Arkansas National Guard in 1957. So the U.S. Supreme Court rules in Brown v. Board of Education that racial segregation in schools was not permitted. Enter the Little Rock Nine, a group of students which were going to go to the Little Rock Central High School. The governor of the state, Orville Faubus, ordered the National Guard to turn them away from the school in the interests of preserving the peace. Well, the National Guard did just that, following the orders of their chain of command. This did not sit well with President Eisenhower, who used his authority to call the Arkansas National Guard into federal service. Their chain of command no longer went to the governor, it went to Ike. The governor could order what he liked, the Arkansas Guard could no longer listen. Ike decreed that the Arkansas Guard would best serve federal interests by sitting in their barracks, and it was so ordered. The soldiers followed the orders of their current chain of command and sat there, with the exception of some units who were ordered by the local federal military commander to be prepared to enforce federal law. Which brings us to another of those little quirks of Posse Comitatus I'd mentioned I'd come back to. You will note that the 101st Airborne was sent in to ensure that the schools safely made it to school, not guardsmen, Title 10 soldiers. The Enforcement Acts in broad terms, permits the use of army troops to enforce federal laws when no other options are possible. Okay, so let's move on to the next group of armies. You will recall I had mentioned that state military departments usually had army and air national guards and state militias. The latter, or sometimes called state militia, state defense force, the state military reserve, or in Texas's case, the state guard. They can also have a naval component, such as New York's. A little over half the states have an operating state militia, about a half dozen have an operating naval militia. These are funded purely by the states, with the exception of some of the naval militias, which can be federally funded, and you can easily tell a state militiaman from a guardsman. They will often wear a state flag instead of a US flag, and where the name tape says US Army for a guardsman, it'll say the state. The competence and capabilities of these state forces can vary greatly. Some are routinely unarmed, some are poorly trained in military duties. Others are quite professional. Regardless of the practical effect, though, the legal effect is that these are a military force answering to the state government which is not answerable to the federal government and which cannot be called into federal service. If a state, for some reason, wanted to spend the money on equipping and training their defense force to the standards of a small European country, well, they can do it. The practical reality, of course, is that state militias have not been used in a military role since World War II. Instead, they are used for support to civil authorities as an organization directly responsive to the governor instead of to county or city authorities as most police and health agencies are. Like the federal military, these state militias are also broken up into organized and unorganized reserves, though again, each state may pick a different name. The organized reserves are those who are currently in the militia. The rest, normally the state reserve militia, or words to that effect, are subject to the state draft. And eligibility can be different to the federal rules, especially to ensure that somebody's still around once the feds have taken their cut. So, for example, there is no authority currently in federal law to draft women. However, if you're an able-bodied female aged 17 to 45 in Illinois, who is or intends to be a US citizen, congratulations, you are in the militia and you can be drafted by the governor. If you're an able-bodied person, male or female, aged 16 to 55 in Virginia, you're in a militia. It is also possible for a private organization to be licensed by a state governor to be raised as a unit and subjected to the orders of the government, but I'm not sure if any such organizations currently exist. They certainly used to. Right, 
I think I've about covered the various different official armies and militias of the US, things are more or less similar for other branches, and in addition to reserves also include auxiliary components like the Civil Air Patrol, Coast Guard Auxiliary, or organizations like the Navy's Ready Reserve Force, which is kept by the US Maritime Administration. So I just wanted to knock that topic out since I've encountered a few questions on the matter recently and I am going to revert to my more normal subjects in the next video. I hope you found it all interesting and informative. Uh, don't forget also uh, click subscribe and click the little bell icon. I'm not quite sure how it works and it doesn't seem to notify people although you're supposed to uh, but it does seem to help the channel so I'd ask that you do that. And I will see you on the next one. Take care.